interviewing uh, John Davis Butler uh, on the 11th or uh, November 27th, 2002, at Mary L. Cook Library. I'm uh, John John D. Butler, from Lebanon, Ohio, 233 Old Route 122, Lebanon, Ohio. It's my address at the present. Been there. 30 years or more. Anyway, uh, are you are you interested in my service? Yeah, but yeah. Uh, you can tell us uh, okay. where you're born. Okay, I was <clears throat> I was born in Breathitt County, Kentucky, Jackson, Breathitt County, Kentucky, in a little small town, Cheno called Cheno Lee, <clears throat> and. Uh, Finished school or eighth grade down there in, uh, in uh, Kentucky. Went to a first year high school at a Christian high school, a first year high school. And then my father moved to Ohio and finished my 12th, 12th grade, graduated from the high, from high school at Kings Mills, Ohio, at the age of about 17 years old, and worked at part time until jobs until I got to 18 and I went to General Motors, Frigidaire, and got a job at Frigidaire, General Motors. Worked six months and decided that I was not ready to settle down. This is my, this is my, after I was 18 years old. Now, my 19th birthday came up and I was wanting to do something besides just remain in that locale at, the same, at that time. Didn't have the finances to travel on my own, so I went to uh, saw the sign to join the army and, and see the world. So that was my what I went down to the recruiting office, tried the navy, but the navy wasn't taking. So I went to the to the uh, infantry, the army, and they were taking high school graduates, which I I had that in my favor. So I enlisted for three years, and I told them to send me as far away from Ohio as possible, so I couldn't come home on a week on a weekend pass. So they <laughs> they sent me down to Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And I enlisted on April the 28th, of 1948, and was sent down there to take basic training during the summer months from May, June, and July of that year my basic. And I thought Ohio was hot, but South Carolina was, it puts the pinnacle on heat, especially if you're outside. Marching in those days, you march and hit. You trained in sand, you take one step forward and one backward. Anyway, I got through that. Got my basic, passed everything, and, and uh, I was ready to come back to Ohio, but they asked, would I like to take a course in mechanics? I took a course in, in uh, the automobile mechanic, or mechanics for Jeeps and trucks and Florida. It's a fifth, es fifth echelon. And it's this uh, training where you were able to do it in everything outside of the motor, except going inside the motor. So. I had taken that course, and by that time, about, about uh, August, and uh, came back to Ohio for a order to train, come back to Ohio with my train, take 10, took 10 days of leave at my home, and then boarded the train on to Seattle, Washington. There for, and uh, my assignment was to go to Yokohama, Japan, to be in the 11th Airborne, going to be a paratrooper. But uh, I boarded the ship, heading for Yokohama, Japan, from Seattle. The uh, getting out on on the ocean, I never I'd never seen a, the ocean either Atlantic or Pacific. Getting out there, why uh, the uh, 
I was warned that you'll be seasick. Um, he said, well, and, the, and, and I was also told that seasickness is, a, is all in your mind. So if you can control your mind, you won't be, you'll be able to open it. No, not be seasick. I said, well, we'll try that. So I saw men heaving over the side, sick, uh, feeling like death was coming on. But I heard the man say that if you control your mind, you wouldn't get seasick. So all through that 20-some days going from Seattle to Yokohama, I, I was not seasick one time. But uh, got out and passed the international date line on November the 15th of 1948. They have a ceremony you go through out there when you pass over that. But uh, got into Yokohama, Japan, and I'd never seen any foreigners in all my whole 19 years. All I'd seen was I see the Negro and the white person. That's all I all I knew. I got to Japan and saw all these the Japanese, all black-haired people, yellow skin, black hair, and uh, well, I uh, I never saw one. Japanese with any other color but black hair. And I've been used to have seeing all kinds of hair, red and whatever, you know, red and black and, and brown. And so this was kind of an unusual sight for me. But anyway, got into Japan and uh, reported to my unit, the 11th Airborne, when they were planning on coming home. They were been over there and was ready to rotate back to the States. I was not near, I was not near ready to come back home, so I, they gave me a choice to waiver to another outfit so I could stay in that area. So I uh, wavered to the 519 military police. And so I had, uh, didn't know what I was getting into, but anyway, I, uh, was shipped out there and, and had to take, and I was assigned to the motor pool since I had that MOS on my records, mechanic. And for several months I was, in, I was a mechanic. But that was not the style that I wanted to have, so I, I asked the company commander if I could, I'd like to be a MP, a patrol, foot patrol, motor patrol, whatever. He said, well, you have to take extra training, so I was uh, went into a training period, learned how to use the 45 uh, pistol sidearm and uh, nightstick, and assigned the duty as foot patrol and cabaret patrol. We were in an occupying mode over there at that time. Japan was in, we had, uh, the war was over in 45, and here it was 48, three years later. And we were in occ occupation mode. So I decided I got my training and started my patrol, being started on foot patrol and cabaret patrol and finally to the jeep, jeep uh, motor patrol. Did that for 22 months. Uh, when I went into service, I we were in a war of words between Moscow, Moscow and, uh, and, and Washington with the communist, the communist regime was trying to expand at that time. And so before this war of words was to escalate, I decided back then that I was going to join and try to get some training in. That's the reason, one of the primary reasons I enlisted, but you know, not on June the 25th of 1950, the communist, North Korean communist, invaded South Korea, and our 24th division was holding in that area under the command of General James Dean. And General Dean was a brave, one of the bravest men I believe Korea had, but he was 
and he was captured, unbeknownst to everyone, until the war was over. When the war was over in '53, he was released. But until then, we did not know where he was at. But anyway, June the 25th, 1950, the war started in Korea. I was in Japan as an MP at the time, and so not knowing what the status would be for about three months, from 25th of June to till September the 15th. In the meantime, uh, President Truman called on General Douglas MacArthur, our uh, hero of World War II, since the, the communists had taken over all of Korea, except for a small base we had in the very tip of South Korea. And President Truman called on uh, General Douglas MacArthur to go back and take this, take this peninsula back. And so General MacArthur put his feelers out, got all qualified men. Well, I was an infantryman first and then a and then an MP second. And I figured I would go right on to the front line. Uh, but uh, he, uh, he got an armada of about 150 ships, cargo and, and personnel headed for Korea. And our unit, the 519 MPs, was activated to go to Korea. And so we boarded the uh, boarded ship in Yokohama and headed, headed out. And uh, unbeknownst to me, I'd been a kind of a chauffeur for my commander, MP, colonel there for a different time. He wanted to go a different place. And I was kind of a chauffeur for him at different times. And he assigned me to a van that was going to be used by one of our commanding generals in Korea. So this, he said, this is your, you take care of this. So it was lashed down on the ship's top deck. I was, and it was my job to make sure they got over there. The cables, of course, were tightened it down. And it uh, had turnbuckles to keep the cables tight. And so during the storms and tossing back and forth and going out, like if a storm came up, you had to get out there and make sure those cables were or else you would lose your, lose your vehicle over the side, which I saw over in distance from my, along with going in, the, in that, in that uh, armada, I saw vehicles go over the side where the men weren't really keeping their, keeping their guard up and keeping the cables back. But anyway, got over to, uh, in the Korean area, and uh, we sat out there for about 10 days or so. In the meantime, the naval ships, the Big Mo, Missouri, and, and different ones were throwing shells onto the shore to uh, soften up the landing area. And we were to go in in Incheon, but the, the North Koreans didn't know where we were going. They thought we were going to go somewhere else. But anyway, the time we went in, the, uh, it would, we had light resistance. I wasn't in that initial uh, going in with the first wave. But anyway, when I came in, the vehicle I was to take care of, it was offloaded with a crane onto an LST. And I said, so I climbed in the cab and went right down with my vehicle. And when the, when the vehicle, when we pushed off to shore, the gate was let down and I drove the vehicle right off the, the LST right on the shore and then uh, headed in convoy north, back north, where our troops had already secured the area of a large uh, amount of troops went in, secured the area, and other troops came in from the south, and we was in a, there was several, I'd say about 100,000 of North Koreans were captured down there. And so it just about broke the North Korean army. So from, from that time on to going back toward the north, the, uh, it was 
brave, not a hard task for our army to take that country. So we went, our men went right on back and went out and right on to the Yalu River, out to the Manchurian border. That's where they, that's where they were holding up. But my, my, my job at the time was to take care of this vehicle. So we went up to a staging area and there it was parked and then uh, the commanding, the officer that I was uh, to be uh, orderly or whatever was General Allman, General Allman. And I did this, took care of this van as an orderly. When he was out of it, I would clean it and make sure, and then I would guard it day and, uh, day and night. I did this for several months till the uh, winter of uh, 50 and 51. And then the, uh, the Korean Peninsula was secure, but then General MacArthur and President Truman got in a little dispute on authority or something. Anyway, uh, President Truman called General MacArthur home. And so this seemingly gave the Chinese a signal that we had weakened. And so at that time, the Chinese, whenever MacArthur would come home, the Chinese invaded South. North Korea and drove our troops back south with all with a terrible loss of life and our men had to fight a, a retreat all the way from the Yaler River back down to this below the 38th parallel and I got caught in this the 10th Corps which I was in the 10th Corps that was my uh, area of duty, 10th Corps headquarters, because that's where the officers were. But we, we, along with all the rest of the military, was pushed out of Korea at that time. And uh, we escaped, my unit, my outfit, 10th Corps headquarters, we escaped by our ships out in the harbor. They threw shells over our heads and put out a perimeter around us so that we can back up. We backed up to the port of Hung Nam. And fortunately myself, we got off off of the off of the peninsula. And uh, I was fortunate to get a, a tugboat. <laughs> tugboat captained by a Japanese captain. And I had been in Japan since 22 months, so I was able to speak a little Japanese. So we had quite a little chit-chat going from, from there out to the ship. Out in the ship in the harbor out there, the, the uh, main ship that we were to board, they threw a ladder over the side these, uh, where several troops could climb the, the side of the ship at one time to get up, get up there and get over into the, into the ship. Anyway, got boarded the ship, and they took us all that got out, and they, the demolition crew went over and they destroyed the port of Hong Nam, and we moved on down south to southern Korea, South Korea, where we had a, a small base down there that was that the men were holding. We offloaded there and followed. I was in the, I was in the, still in the tenth port. Followed the troops north till we got to uh, Seoul, Korea, Seoul, South Korea. And that was where they were going to be the set up the headquarters for the Tenth Corps. That was going to command the troops that were up front. And so we had a huge building, a large building there. That I don't know just what it was before, but we we secured it, made sure that there was no booby traps and stuff, and then they left them officers move in. And that was my duty for the next few months to take care of that uh, building and take care of that area as a guard, as guard duty. I'd be on 12 hours and off eight. 
you know, that 12 hours, you'd, you'd uh, guard two hours, and then you'd take two hours, and then you'd guard two hours, and two hours, until you got your 12 hours, and then you get eight hours of rest. So it was a, it was a good duty. And through the summer of 50, I mean, the latter part of 50, say September, uh, October, November, through the winter of, of 50 and 51, this was my duty. Well, in uh, April, April the 28th of 51 was my anniversary for my three years of being in service. And I was, I'd been in Korea and for almost for over for over nine months, and hadn't seen a, I hadn't seen one bit of, not nine months, about six months, and I hadn't seen any combat. I was just uh, in the rear area. So I figured I would be rotating back to the States pretty soon because my enlistment was going to be up starting on my fourth year, which Truman, Mr. Truman gave me that one. But anyway, I was frustrated and I wanted to, and I, and I said, well, when I go, go home, I wanted to be able to tell my, my family and friends that I was just nothing more than nothing but a guard on guard duty in Korea. I'd made corporal in EMPs. That's a, a two-striper, a three-striper. This is Sergeant First Class. But I'd made corporal in uh, EMPs, and so uh, I was. I said, if I was going home, I would like to have something to tell the people, other than I'd been a guard. A guard. So I told the sergeant. I told my sergeant guard. I said, I'd like to see the company commander. He said, what, what's on your mind? I said, well, it's personal. So he said, okay. So he made, made me an appointment, went in, CQ, said, come in, and went into the, the colonel. And he was very respectful. He said, soldier, what, what's on your mind? I said, well, I've been over here about six months. I haven't seen any combat. I said, I'd like to go up to the front. He said, are you crazy? Do you know what you're getting into, soldier? I said, well, I was trained to be a soldier, and if I go home without going into combat, I'm not, it won't be, I won't, I'll feel like I haven't fulfilled what I was supposed to be doing. So he said, very well. So he said, your order to be be here in about 10 days. So about 10 days later, or, or maybe a little less, came through. And I was unloaded, loaded on a truck with several other men, taken to, to go up to the front. Replacements is what we were. You didn't go up as a unit, you went up as a replacement. And so, and so it always, always when you move, seemed like you always, when you get there, it's dark. Either you start out in the dark or you get there in the dark. And so we got up got up to where we were supposed to take our advanced training. You always get advanced training when you're going into combat if you have time. And so got up to this uh, area. It was raining, dark, raining, ground, muddy. They all offloaded you on the tr off the truck. And our, our duty then was to set up a camp. So whenever you set camp up, you first thing you do, you try to put up a mess tent. That's a place where the cooks prepare your food. Second, you go to you dig a slit trench for your for your bathroom, about six inches wide, and then according to how many men you got in the, in an area, you, so much space. But anyway, the, all you got is a canvas about four foot high. And that will stretch along on the side and keep you away from the civilian population. And so we got that job done. And then the next was to take care of your home self. So we had a we have a two men pup tents. You carry them on your on your back, called shelter halves. And uh, so we set those up. Uh, uh, you get you you have a buddy. You set those up 
drive your sticks in the ground. I looked for a place, a little high ground, so it wouldn't be in the mud. Anyway, you got the tent up, there's, all, there's always a little there's a canvas floor in the bottom of it. So you ditch around the outside of it so the water and stuff don't run through your area where you're going to try to bed down. So, got that done. We got inside, wore out, and uh, woke up the next morning. My sun was shining and headed, headed for the best tent where we had uh, we had scrambled eggs, those dehydrated eggs. They put water in them, then they serve it out to you. That's for your hot meal, <laughs> for your breakfast. Anyway, uh, took, they started our training. And I was assigned to a 60 millimeter uh, mortar, mortar squad, which is basically you have a, a eight pound mortar that, that you load in a, in a, well, anyway, the mortars shoot. And it's, it's, uh, like a pipe. And this mortar, you just drop it in, hand loaded, you drop it in, and it's propelled by a, a shotgun shell. And you have a base to that, and you have a tripod with a leveling mechanism here. And uh, after a while, you get good at fast. You have to do this fast to set up real quickly. So we had a 21 seconds. I, my, uh, my partner and I, we could set up a, we could throw the base down, set the set the tube on the base, put the tripods down, and put the leveling mechanism up, and have a target in, in 21 seconds. It was kind of a very, very good grade on that. Anyway, we, well, we only had this training for about 10 days, and then it's time to go up to the, to, to the unit. Notice on, on trucks, another time in the dark, get up to where you're supposed to go up the hill, it's in the dark. My partner and I, we had our shelter hat and your equipment on, and got in the back of the truck, loaded on, got up there, and for daylight, and I come out of the back of the truck first, and then my partner, he comes out following me, and he hits a, uh, he hits a stone, sprains his ankle. And that's the last time I saw him. He had to go back to the rear, and uh, I later found out he was in a trucking outfit. But the next time I saw him was 29 years later over in General Motors, where I worked for, until I retired. 29 years after I'd seen him in Korea. <laughs> anyway, they, they got up, started up the hill, heard rifle fire, you know, this is early in the morning, four daylight. Started up the hill, heard rifle fire from up on the hill. Got on up there with no no problem, and uh, this time it's getting daylight. Up in the, and uh, met our platoon sergeant. He assigned us to our uh, squad. Since I was corporal, he, he made me squad leader. So that you got a rank, you got to do the job. So he made me, I was squad leader. And he said, by the way, he said uh, we're about a half a mile out in front of the main units. They're back here and we were out on this ridge in front. On our right side was a punch called a punch bowl area. On my left on the left side out there was canyons and valleys where nothing would come up that side. But over here on the punch bowl side you'd be he said we're subject to probes. And so sure enough, well, about three o'clock that afternoon, uh, I've never been in combat, never been under fire. And he, uh, I heard down over the hill, down in front of us, we had where we were supposed to keep a watch on. I heard uh, something rustling down there, and all at once, I, someone, they started noise, went beating on pots and pans, and psychological warfare, they call it. Anyway, they, uh, Broken English from a Korean, North Korean says, "GI, you're gonna die. GI, you're gonna die." And then about that time, they cut loose with a fire, a rifle fire. Started their assault up the hill. 
our men, our men, we were were ready except me. I was, I was had the fear. I did not. I was paralyzed with fear. And my only thing was I was on the ground, paralyzed with fear. And now this is uh, this is facts, truth. Every man, I believe, every man goes into combat. Initially, he's going to have fear. But uh, being a squad leader, I said, this is no way for a man to have. And I'd already, I had uh, had faith in God and give my heart to the Lord for, for salvation. And I said, I just called out, Lord, help me. And calm came over me that lasted to the mountains of the rest of the time that I was in the, in the, in the Korean in the combat area. From that time forth, in any way, the, we uh, held the North Koreans. They were just probing more or less, but we held them off, and ceasefire was, the command was given. Stayed in that, stayed in that area for several weeks, they are, they're always wanting you to go take this hill and take that hill. And, and when you when you take a hill, then it's always the North Koreans are ready to take it back. It's and, and in and in and in Korea where we were at, we had a line all the way across the peninsula, from east to west. We had uh, UN troops from all over the world. We had Dutch. British, French, Canadians, all different outfits. And I've had several from different countries. But as they would move up, our unit would have to move. And so different times you'd get in. But, and then as they got, sometimes as they, uh, North Koreans and Chinese got stronger and, and would push us back, we'd have to fight a uh, rear guard action one experience I had a, a friend, a, a buddy of mine, we had to be the, we had to be the rear guard on, on, the, on the withdrawal. And so you had to lay down fire while the other men are moving back. You had to lay down fire. You were the last one down. I was into that at one time. Another time we was moving up and uh, on the hill ahead of us, machine gun set up. North Koreans had a machine gun set up. And we come up this, made our way up, came to a little a cliff about 10 foot, 12 foot high. And the, the North Koreans had the, the Chinese, whatever, they had the, both sides of it zeroed in with the machine gun. Nobody could get around either side. And so, we had a recoilless rifle back in the rear of us about, uh, on the next ridge back. And they could fire uh, several thousand yards. And, uh, but there was no way to, for them to know where the, where, the, where the enemy was at. And so we were getting mowed down, mowed down going around the side, couldn't get over the top. So I, I asked the, uh, I asked the captain, I said, somebody boost me up on top, I'll, I'll look out there and try to get that, give that uh, 75 recoil us uh, a firing order. So he said, okay, well, got someone boost me up and I got up on that rock. There was about a three foot of grass and weeds that were growing up on top of the rock. And I was able to take cover on the, on the, by, the by that grass and weeds but the, uh, I saw up, up on the hill about 50 yards in front of me a machine gun in a, in a bunker with a small hole for the, for the barrel to come out. And while I was uh, observing, evidently he must have uh, found out that someone was going to get on top of that rock. But him, somehow or other, his gun would not had a cover enough that his gun would not reach down to where I was at. It was cutting the weeds off over my head. But I was able to give, to 
directions from to my company commander, he radioed back to the recorder's rifle to for the fire. The recorder's rifle I told him to fire uh, fire around him so I could see where he where was at. And they would fire these WP white phosphorus where you smoke right where you could see where they were going. From the fire around in there, and then I directed him from that to uh, to where the machine gun place was. And when we got it zeroed in, I thought, fire for effect. Fired about three, four rounds, and the last round I saw it went right into that bunker and blew the machine gun up. And the men were able to move around and went up and took the hill. Other incidents, well, one time we had a, a captain, we had a, we were on this ridge and down over in the field below us, about 100 yards out there, down over this hill in the valley. Our men were pinned down and they were being assaulted by our enemy. And um, the captain called for volunteers to go down there and help those guys out. So we so I made sergeant. I made sergeant first class for this time. I, I made went from corporal to sergeant to sergeant first class only by staying alive. You stay alive and you got any wits about you, you, you move up and rank. And I, so he just asked me, said, Sergeant Butler said, we need to go down there and said, we need some volunteers. You can get some volunteers, we'll go down and see if we can help them out. So I called the volunteers, we got five men to go with me along with the, with the lieutenant. And we started down the hill to, the, to where they were at, but too late. By the time we got down there, they were, they had already, what North Koreans weren't killed, they moved out, but they had killed our killed our soldiers that were trying to hold that area. We just couldn't get to them in time. But the day the day that I the day that we talk about in September, first of September of of uh, fifty one, we were ordered to, to take this hill was not a large hill, about less than a thousand feet high. We were, we were ordered to take this hill. Started out early in the morning and uh, skirmished during the day till evening. Finally in the evening we finally were able to move up, everybody moving together, finally able to move up the time we got to the hill. Uh, placement for the Koreans were at, they were gone. They were taken off. But uh, what they do when they take off, they leave booby traps. So I got my men in place. Foxholes were ready for counterattack, and uh, the uh, my corpsman, well, this time it was almost dusty dark, my corpsman came by and he was going up to Captain had a flesh wound on his shoulder, and he was going up to change the dressing on his, put the dressing on his shoulder wound. And uh, I, he was not very, his vision was bad and he, at night. Couldn't see hardly anything, but he was a good corpsman. Got to take care of your wound. So he was coming by my position, and I knew he was going to get off of that little path that we had probed out for safety, walk from one position to the other. So I got him by the arm and I led him up through there and we went to the command, commander's office bunker. It was kind of a 45 degree incline where he was at. And I sat down and waited. For this time it was, it was about 8 or 9 o'clock dark. And down in the valley, about so many miles down the valley, they, in order to help us out up in the mountains, they would shine a, they turned a spotlight up on the on a cloud up over our position. And uh, this uh, this particular night, we had, it was cloudy, and so they put this spotlight up on the clouds, and we were able to see around us anything moving. And as I was coming back down this to our position, the light got in my eyes, and I got off of that little path that we were 
safety pad and stepped over the side and tripped a, a, a wire that led to a booby trap. Uh, uh, the explosion uh, sent front shrapnel past my left leg and put a piece of shrapnel into my right leg. That uh, went all the way through except for about a half an inch on the, on the other side. And, uh, but before this all happened, when I got into that foxhole and got my men in place, I, had, uh, I prayed, I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, I'd like to go home. Now I've been in combat, I'd like to go home. And so, at, uh, in less than an hour, this incident happened where I was helping my corpsman and uh, had received, got this, got this wound, and he'd also got a wound in his elbow, put us both out of commission. And so they got us out of this minefield, put us up, put us up in safety area, and our captain said, we're not going to be able to send you off the hill tonight, so you're going to have to wait till tomorrow. Well, the North Koreans had infiltrated our line, they would, in a foggy condition, they would infiltrate your line, go all right past and go right on back and back of it. He said, they're, they're lit, uh, ambushing their litter barrier down the back of it. I said, you can't go off, you won't go off the hill tonight. So we stayed on the hill that night, give us morphine to keep the pain down. Next morning, about 10 o'clock, after the uh, area was cleared in the back, they, uh, they let us, uh, took us off, there was four, four guys to carry me off and one guy, the other, the other guy walked off by him. He was able to walk off. We got down the hill about two o'clock in that afternoon and got able to get on a jeep. They took us down to the medical tent, which we've all seen through the years, the mash, something similar to that. The surgeon said, Sergeant Butler said, you're not going, you're going to have to go back to, we're going to send you to Japan for surgery and rehab. And, rehab. That's fine with me. So we brought back to Yokohama, Japan, where I'd been an MP for 22 months. <laughs> Got back into the hospital. And my records caught up with me at that time. And whenever they, they sent me word that you're not going going back to Korea, you're going home. So that was a highlight of my military career to be able to come home after getting seemingly the my wishes of what I, I didn't want to come home without my baptism of fire in combat. So that, I came home and in, in uh, November of 51, I was, I was wounded September the 8th of 1951. I was sent home and had my choice since I was starting the first class, I didn't see, oh, I had my choice of either coming by ship or by plane. I was kind of in a hurry to get home, so I chose a plane, a DC-154, I believe it was a four-engine cargo plane, no, no, uh, uh, couldn't pressurize anything, so we flew about 500 feet to 1,000 feet over the Atlantic, all of them, or the Pacific, all the way to, all the way to Seattle, and uh, got home in uh, November. Last part of November, took 30 days, and was assigned to uh, 3rd Armored Division in Fort Knox, Kentucky, as a drill sergeant and, and a trainer for the recruits who were coming in to go to Korea. So from uh, November to, to uh, April 28th of 1948, or in 1952, that was my duty as stateside duty, trainer the men to take my place. So that's about the that's about the scenario for my military career. <laughs> oh, have you got any questions or anything? Do you want him to hold this up and explain some of that? Uh, yeah, I have a couple questions. Go ahead. Um, so you were in Japan when the North Koreans came across the border and attacked South Korea. Yes. What was the um, the atmosphere like in in uh, Japan at that in point? Japan. We were in that occupying mode, as I said before. We knew that uh, if uh, us that had the MOS, hmm. as fighting infantrymen or whatever, 
would be called on to go to Korea. But we didn't know when. And it was for a couple of months or so. We were still just in that mode of not knowing what we were going to do. But then the orders came that the whole the whole unit, the 519 MPs, the whole unit was going to be sent to Korea. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't to go wasn't to go as an MP, I was to go as a, as an infantry member. Yet somehow or other I was assigned to this van, this mobile van that was to take to be an officer's quarters. And so that was my duty to get in over there and, and I was in that in that tenth corps. Mm -hmm. 8th Armored Division, 8th Armored Division, the 10th Corps. Okay, but was it, was it a little bit of shock that that had happened, or was there some warning that you guys... That well, the, uh, the war of words were going on and it was getting, the communists were getting, uh, they were getting to that where they wanted to do more than just words. And so North Korea figured they would take South Korea because they didn't figure that Harry Truman would want to get into another war after World War II. So they figured if they just they just take it, it would just pull out. But they didn't, uh, like the Japanese, they didn't, uh, they didn't recognize, reckon with what the United States was. And they had a, uh, and they had a duty, the United States usually performed it. And so when they came in there, we didn't know what was going to, was going to happen, uh, but we all thought that we'd probably get caught up in it. Okay. And uh, when MacArthur got relieved by uh, Truman, what was your feeling about that? Uh, that was, uh, that was uh, to all the men there, that was uh, a low blow. Because we, MacArthur was one of the greatest strategicians, army generals that ever was. Whenever, we didn't have time to think, because whenever MacArthur was pulled out in just a short time, mm -hmm. uh, North Korea, the Chinese came in and overwhelmed all of our the men that was up there. They, they did not have a chance. There were so many of them, the Chinese, that our men just didn't have a chance. They would come in droves, just mm -hmm. one right after the other. One man, they didn't even all have, didn't even all have weapons. One would drop a weapon, get shot down, and another one would pick it up and come on. Just okay. like that. So the Chinese coming in was a kind of a big surprise. Oh yes. <laughs> so. And uh, see, I was I was in the rear area at that time, down in the headquarters there. But they came on down, forced our men men back, and then they Tenth Corps had to evacuate also. We were forced out. Okay. And uh, when you came home, um, they kind of call Korea the Forgotten War. Um, was, what, what was your impression when you came home and the people well, in the states? A, I saw what happened in World War II, and uh, saw the big parade, the ticker tapes, and all that. And when I got home, and I couldn't even find headlines in the paper about what was going on. It, it saddened me. It, it sure did. So, and uh, it, uh, I was so that the men that were dying over there, we lost thirty-seven thousand men in, in a period of three years, and that's over 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 ten thousand a year that we were losing in Korea. And whenever I came home, we had no. No recognition. It was pretty sad. Okay. Um, get the, we're gonna let you talk about uh, your pictures and stuff oh. on your your case here. Well, I'll explain a little bit of what what I've got here. These are campaign uh, ribbons of different areas that I served in occupational forces in the Korean War, Korean campaign, and uh, the United, uh, the UN Army that, that we had at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the combat infantry badge. All, all infantrymen, army men, ever go into 
this is the most prized medal you get, and that, you get that when you go under fire in a, in a combat zone. All the time I was in Korea until I went up to the front line, this, I didn't have that, I couldn't have that. But when I went into combat, got into that firefight, first day, this, this was awarded, could be awarded to me. This, this is the Purple Heart. I got that when I was wounded on September the 8th of, of 51. This was, this was an award for wounded in action. This is my, um, as an MP, military policeman in Japan, a picture there, and frolicking around here and some of our combat or uh, fatigues unit that we use in the, as a, as a, out in the field. This is a 38th Infantry Regiment patch, which was my unit when I was went up to the front. This is the 8th Army, which I was stationed in, was the 8th Army, which was part of it. 10th Corps, and this is called the I Corps, but it's, it's a 10th Corps here. And this is the headquarters, general headquarters, past the, before I got to the front. But this is the front line, what I had when I was in combat on 38th Infantry Regiment, 2nd Battalion, C Company. And that's what I was in until I was wounded. And I was in, I was in combat almost uh, about six months mm -hmm. before I got wounded. I saw men all around me killed and wounded. In fact, before I could, before I was ready to come home, I wanted, I was eligible to come home, but I could not get a replacement since sergeant you had to be, you had to have replacements at your rent. Mm -hmm. So I tried to train men to, to get them ready to take over, but they would get wounded before I would, before I would even get them ready. Uh, uh, a guy named Johnson, I was getting him ready, he was really gung-ho and ready to go. We got into a scrimmage, and uh, the guy got a, he got about 15 pieces of shrapnel in him, and had to, he had to go back to the rear. He was in different ones. But the only the day that I got wounded, I just left it up in the hands of the Lord. You could, uh, at any minute, you could have been, I could have been killed, but I was, I was very fortunate, very fortunate to come through all that, and, and the only wound I got was at the, at the last door when I, could, when I could come home. And to me, it was an answer to a prayer. It was an answer to a prayer. So, uh, this is about all there is to see. I'll, I'll put this stuff together and and <laughs> had it for a few years. And in my uniform, had it in the cedar chest, and I'm still able to go. When we have parades in Lebanon and uh, Memorial Day. I'm, I'm able to wear my jacket. Of course, my trousers are a little bit tight. <laughs> Don't wear them anymore. <laughs> but but uh, the, uh, able to wear my jacket. So, whenever I was uh, asked to, I would like to give my little scenario on my experiences in service. Why? I thought, well, our World War II veterans were dying and leaving out at about 1,800 a day. And so I said, well, if we don't ever, if we don't get this down, it's going to be a week ago. There'll be nobody to. No one to know that we were ever in a, right. in a war and whatever happened. So it's uh, it's been my pleasure to, to uh, kind of give a little scenario of what what happened.